Okay, so welcome to this um, event in the um, Conflict Research Group's um, public event series for this year. And welcome to the government department of the LSE. Um, my name is Bill Kassan. I'm an associate professor in the government department. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this um, session on how much danger is American democracy in at the moment. I think I'd like to say a few things before I, I introduce the speaker. Um, and one of the things is, uh, of course, about the, the topic itself of democratization, how, how rapidly it changes, because up to, I suppose, this year, we all thought that the big new concept in, in democratic theory was democratic backsliding, this idea that democracy was going in reverse in various parts of the world, but at the same time, over the last um, 12 months, we've seen democratic protests in Thailand. We see them in Myanmar. We've seen them in Turkey. We've seen them in Belarus. We've seen them in Nigeria. We've seen them obviously in Hong Kong. So democracy is still very much a live aspiration for uh, many people in the world. So it's kind of very difficult, I suppose, to know where it's going globally. But one thing we, we thought we did know, which is that um, there were certain countries, mainly in the Western orbit of experience, that had kind of made it as democracies and had become kind of consolidated democracies, and we could rely on them remaining democratic. And of course, one of those cases was the United States. And I think the events of the last um, uh, 12 months or the last four years, or however you like to measure it, have shown really how unstable many of our expectations are when it comes to looking at different regimes and the way in which it's not just open military coup d'etats that bring down democracy, it's also more kind of erosion of, of democratic values and, and subsequently institutions. And this is not just a, a question of the economic crisis that hit America in, in 2008 and onwards. It's also very much to do with the presidency and it's also very much to do with the party system and the system of checks and balances, which normally we thought were the things that kept America um, together as a democracy. So there's a real issue here in terms of how we interpret where we are, I think, in terms of the world's largest and most powerful democracy. Is America now um, in serious existential danger as a democracy? Is it still consolidated? Has the election of Joe Biden saved American democracy? And these are all really very live questions. And, and today we've got um, um, uh, an associate professor from UCL, um, Professor Brian Klaas, who is actually a native of America, originally from Minnesota and educated in, in, in North America, but also in the University of Oxford where he got his PhD. And he really is a, a kind of an expert person to kind of shed some light on, on where we are in terms of like the danger that American democracy may find itself in. And Brian um, has written kind of two very well received important books, both of them about despotism and one of them about despotism within America, which I'm sure we'll be discussing, and one of them about despotism um, in, 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 in international politics in general. So it, it's a great um, honor to have him here. He's a former uh, member of staff in my department, the government department in the LSE, where he was a, a tutorial fellow um, teaching actually comparative politics and also democratization in the government department. And, and now he's moved up the road um, to um, King or UCL, where he's an associate professor of global politics. So it's a great pleasure to to welcome him. He's going to speak for whatever, 35, 40 minutes. And after that, we're going to have um, a question and answer session and you in the audience, you'll be able to um, send us your, your questions for Brian through the chat function on YouTube. So hopefully there will be a bit of interaction and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. So that's it for me and, and over to, to Brian. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent and kind introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to be speaking from the LSE government department, which was my home for three years professionally, and uh, it's a privilege to be back with you. This is a very strange moment for me personally, because I left US politics where I worked on campaigns. Um, I co-managed a campaign for governor about a decade ago, 
And I left because it was boring and everything worked. In other words, things reasonable, reasonably functional. And I left to study authoritarian politics. And my PhD was about rigged elections, coups, and civil wars. And then if you fast forward, you know, five years after I finished my PhD on those subjects in Sub-Saharan Africa and Eastern Europe and the Middle East, I'm being asked, when Donald Trump says this was a rigged election and the violence that happened after it occurs at the Capitol, was that a coup attempt? It's a very strange thing for an American to be applying these lessons of authoritarian politics that we used to think of as happening over there, so to speak, now coming home and ravaging uh, the domestic politics of what Professor Kassan was right to say is the most powerful democracy in the world, the United States. I'm gonna talk about um, a variety of different angles to this question, but I think you're going to find that my answer to the question is that American democracy is in quite bad shape. It is in very dangerous circumstances and the erosion of democracy in America is ongoing. So I don't think by any stretch of the imagination we are out of the woods yet with the election of Joe Biden. And I think that even though it will significantly improve some aspects, we're still going to face some serious challenges. Now, how do we deal with these questions? How do we break them down into a more sort of uh, you know, coherent way of thinking about this problem? There's a few things that I wanna talk about in two main dimensions. One is that American democracy is in crisis for reasons of structural problems that predate Donald Trump, but that are becoming more and more apparent and more and more destructive as a result of the Trump presidency. So these are things that existed before Trump, but they've gotten worse because of him and they're structural aspects of American democracy. The second thing I'm going to talk about that came about or at least was dramatically accelerated by Donald Trump is what I call the asymmetrical authoritarian radicalization of Republican party politics. What I mean by that, I'll go into detail in a moment, but basically this is a part about democracy in America specific to one political party, its embrace of some authoritarian tactics and the ways in which Donald Trump created that or at least made that dynamic much, much worse than it was in 2015, for example. So to start with the structural stuff, this is the stuff that predates Donald Trump but got made worse by him. I wanna introduce two quick concepts of input legitimacy and output legitimacy, which are ways in which democracy scholars think about various elements of the democratic process. So input legitimacy is, is sort of a, another word for process legitimacy. It's the idea that the way we make a decision was legitimate, it was democratic, that sort of procedural aspect was fine. Output legitimacy is about outcomes. It's about whether the problem was solved, whether American democracy performed the way that people hoped it would in providing a certain benefit or a certain level of governance to the population. Now for democracy to work properly, you need both input and output legitimacy. You cannot just have one or the other. And I think that this is something, it's a framework by which we can evaluate governments because authoritarian regimes like China sometimes have no input legitimacy in democratic terms, but they're sometimes able to produce some level of output legitimacy in terms of say, alleviating poverty. So they've produced a good outcome. What I'm going to argue is that when it comes to structural problems, the US has issues with both input and output legitimacy. There are issues where the procedure is flawed and there are also issues in which the outcome is severely flawed and that is challenging American democracy. So how can we think about this in terms of the process? Well, the first place to start is one of the most obvious. It's the electoral college. So the electoral college is something that has long been, well, for, since the founding of the country has been part of how you elect presidents in the United States. And it's supposed to deal with this problem of creating a voice for the states so that smaller states are not overrun by bigger states. The logic of that made sense. It was born out of a sort of federalist compromise a couple hundred years ago. But now what's happening because of demographic changes in the United States is that it's becoming increasingly likely that if a Republican president is elected, they will be elected with a minority vote in the popular vote, but a majority vote in the Electoral College. And twice in the last 20 years, the person who has ended up in the White House has lost the popular vote, has gotten fewer votes than their opponent, but has ended up in the White House because they got 270 plus electoral votes. And if you think about the 2020 election, if you perfectly sorted about 60,000 voters differently, in other words, if you reallocated votes amongst about 60,000 people 
out of you know more than 100 million votes, about 140 million, 150 million votes, that 60,000 that group of 60,000 people would have tipped the election to Donald Trump if they had changed their votes in the right places. And what that means is that we were very close to having a third instance in two decades in which the popular vote loser won power in the White House. That, in my view, is unsustainable over the long run because this is where it gets back to my, my work around the world. People who were you know, previously getting lectured by the United States about democracy would put back to me when I would talk to them about democratic quality in their own countries, how can you tell us what to do? You don't even give power to the person who wins the most votes, right? And that is a, a fair critique, I think, of the American system that's gaining steam in the process argument. The second aspect is gerrymandering, which is uh, shorthand for basically saying where politicians pick their voters rather than voters picking their politicians. It's where you draw district lines to amplify certain parties at the expense of others for political self-interest. Um, this happens, but the, the origin of the term is briefly interesting. So I'll just tell you the, the, the quick origins. There's a guy named Elbridge Gerry from Massachusetts uh, in the early 1800s who drew the districts or was involved in the districting process in a way that was lopsided. Uh, a political cartoonist drew the shape of a salamander to show one of the district lines and saying, look at how absurd this district is. And the portmanteau of Gary Mander was born. It's now evolved into gerrymander, but that's the sort of history of the, of the term. Now, when you think about its operation, what it functionally does is it creates uncompetitive elections. Combined with something called demographic sorting, which is where Republicans move to places where Republicans live and Democrats move to places where Democrats live and people who live around Democrats become more Democratic and people who live around Republicans become more Republican. The average contest in American politics is not competitive when it comes to congressional elections. If you look at 2016, for example, when I crunched the numbers for the House races, there are 435 House races. The average race had a margin of victory of 37.1%, which means that the average house race in America was a 70-30 landslide. It creates uncompetitive politics, which rewards extremists, right? The reason I say that is because the political party system that exists in a world in which most races are 70-30 landslides is a system that creates an incentive to never compromise. Because if you do compromise, you will face a primary challenger further from the right or further from the left. So if you're a moderate, you get squeezed out. And of course, that's what we've seen in recent years is the moderates are in the wilderness, where the, where the increasingly more extreme sides of each party become national stars, something that I'll talk about more in a moment with refer reference to the Republican Party. Then you have the issue of money in politics, which is a dramatic outlier for the United States compared to its peer countries. Unbridled campaign finance laws where basically money is considered a form of speech and therefore corporations, individuals have large amounts of money that can flow into the system to buy influence. And there have been studies across time that have shown that there has been an increase in the voice of lobbyists and moneyed interests in swaying policy in a way that you would not expect to happen in a democratic system. And finally, I think this is one of the most important ones and one of the least well known is the disproportionate influence of senators from small states in a way that's going to create real problems for America going forward. So if you don't know much about American history, the Senate was part of a great compromise where you basically would allocate the House to proportion based on population and the Senate would be two senators per state regardless of population. Back in the day that was reasonably okay because the gulf of population between different states was not enormous. Now it is. California has so many people compared to small states like say South Dakota or Wyoming, and yet they have equal representation in the Senate. And in 20 years, because of these demographic changes, two thirds of Americans will have 20, oh, sorry, 30 senators, while one third of Americans will have 70 senators. And this one third of Americans with the 70 senators are from the states that are the least representative of American public opinion in general. They are the small, rural, more conservative, more extreme political states who are going to have a dominant majority in the US Senate unless something changes in how the system is set up. In addition to those input legitimacy criticisms and concerns, there's the output legitimacy stuff, which I'm not going to go into great detail about, except to say that they have been on greater display and in greater, you know, more in the public eye during the Trump administration. 
racial injustice, right? I'm from Minneapolis uh, where George Floyd was murdered. And that event has opened up the already gaping wound of racial injustice in the United States to a greater degree. It was there before, but now it is showing that democracy in America is not solving a problem that it's supposed to solve of creating equal justice under the law. Healthcare, right? We have drastically unequal healthcare outcomes based on demographic characteristics, whether it's race or financial status, socioeconomic status in the United States. And of course, more recently <clears throat> related to both of these is the management of the COVID pandemic, which has been disastrous in the United States. The US had significant advantages going into the COVID pandemic, low population density, a car heavy culture, things that would reduce spread normally. And yet it has one of the worst outcomes in the world. And it's a matter of probably a week or two before the US eclipses 500,000 coronavirus deaths, half a million people, uh, which as a output legitimacy point is, is quite dire. So that's the first part of the, the issues that I'm talking about. These things are not necessarily exclusively related to Trump or Trumpism or the last four years, four plus years. The next section I'm gonna talk about is something that's different. It's about what Donald Trump has done to American democracy, what Trumpism has done to the Republican party. And as I said, this concept of the asymmetrical authoritarian radicalization of Republican party politics. Now, a quick caveat, because of what I said before about this aspect where American democracy rewards extremists and punishes moderates, yes, it is true that the left has moved left in the United States relative to how it was before, and the right has moved right. But we have to be clear, the reason I'm talking about Republican politics in particular is not just because of Donald Trump, though that's part of it, but it's also because this is totally, totally asymmetrical. And I think this is one of those things where when the media covers American democracy, the, the sin of both sidism distorts American democracy's current status very, very uh, deeply, which is to say falsely equating two different phenomena is a, is a disservice to understanding American democracy. If you think about the most extreme, the farthest left Democrat in Congress, somebody like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or somebody else from the squad, Ilhan Omar, who's my personal representative in Congress, their radicalism is primarily around things that are not radical in other democracies. Their, their so-called radicalism is things like developing a, America, or sorry, a British or Canadian style healthcare system or having a $15 minimum wage mandated by the government. Now, you may disagree with those ideas, but they are not extreme within the world of democracies. The most extreme member of the Republican caucus uh, in Congress, who was recently elected, is a woman named Marjorie Taylor Greene. She believes not just that Trump won the election, which is a point that we'll come back to momentarily, but that school shootings were fake hoaxes, that 9-11 didn't actually happen, and that Jewish space lasers caused wildflower, wildfire fires in California. And this is somebody who is fundamentally incomparable to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because AOC lives in reality. She is advocating policies based on some level of evidence compared to a conspiratorial, conspiracy theorist, uh, you know, radical who, who fundamentally doesn't inhabit the real world of facts and, and fundamental truths about what's happening. So that is a brief glimpse of what I'm talking about by asymmetry. It's why I'm focusing on the Republican Party, because there is a much more significant impact of this authoritarian radicalization on the Republican side than the Democratic side. And this is just something that's based on the evidence of you know, the, the, the Democratic side doesn't have this level of conspiratorial thinking uh, in its base. And of course, Donald Trump is partly to blame for that because he was somebody who peddled conspiracy theories for four years. Now, this, this element of reality-based politics bleeds into another issue, which is the question of authoritarian politics. Now, for four years, the United States has had somebody who fundamentally mimics authoritarian tactics in the White House. Now, I've been very careful in all of my writing to say Donald Trump is not the same as a dictator. And it's true, he's not. He inhabits a totally different world and a totally different system than authoritarian leaders. But he has definitely borrowed tactics from authoritarian regimes in how he governs in ways that have moved American democracy towards the functioning of those regimes, right? It's not that he's made America authoritarian, it's that he's moved America towards authoritarianism. Now, there was already a predisposition within the Republican party to a certain degree uh, of having authoritarian politics. I'll talk about that in a moment with authoritarian voters. 
But the despot's playbook was part of Trump's playbook. So I'll just articulate a few of these specific dimensions that he used, which are very familiar to anyone who's been following American politics. Attacking the press, right? I mean, Trump tweeted about fake news or the, the news media being the, quote, enemy of the people dozens, if not hundreds of times during his presidency. It was a central component of his political strategy, of, of, of his brand of populism, and it is a central component of authoritarian politics, is when you are trying to uh, constantly lie, which is something that Trump did objectively, we, we have the evidence that this has happened uh, over and over again, and the, the Washington Post, um, for, for whom I write, uh, tra tracked these falsehoods and lies, and there were, I think, around 25 to 30,000 in four years uh, told. So that attacking the press is part of a playbook in which you're trying to get away with saying untrue things for political gain because the press can call you on them if you discredit the press. It's helpful for your political agenda to do so. And that's part of what Trump did. Another hallmark of authoritarian regimes that has now entered American politics via Trumpism is cronyism and nepotism. Now, Trump didn't introduce this. Cronyism and nepotism exists in American history. Ulysses S. Grant gave out you know, plum positions to, to various people he knew, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the level of shamelessness around this is quite a dramatic departure from recent ethics rules around uh, appointments in American politics. The most obvious example, Ivanka Trump, right? I mean, Trump's daughter in a high profile position in the White House, in addition to that, Jared Kushner, who's married to Ivanka Trump, managing a portfolio of enormous importance for the country and the world of, of foreign policy, of all sorts of domestic political items in the agenda. And then you also have the more extreme and absurd examples. So one of my favorite that I found over the last four years is uh, Trump's appointment to the person who ran federal housing for New York and New Jersey, two of the most populated states in the United States. Uh, her name is Lynn Patton, and up until January 20th, she was in charge of federal housing for New York and New Jersey. What was her primary qualification? Well, she planned Eric Trump's wedding. She was Eric Trump's wedding planner, and she lied about having a degree that she did not have and had no background whatsoever in federal housing. That is like scandal 1000 of the Trump administration. It's something people don't even know about because it's so far down the list of the other things that, that happened during the Trump era. You also have demonizing political opponents, something we're gonna come back to when I talk about January 6th, and proclaiming that they are not just people who disagree, but they are enemies or they are scum, using rhetoric that suggests that these people are not part of the legitimate conversation in American democracy, but instead are enemies of a certain faction within American democracy. Then you have the politicization of rule of law, which is part of the literature on democratic backsliding, which is to say that when you make rule of law appear as a weapon or function as a weapon to go after political opponents or to protect political allies, it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle because politicization of rule of law is something that can happen quickly, but recreating the impression of an impartial rule of law takes a very, very long time. Trump's most recent attorney general, Bill Barr, did immense damage, in my opinion, on this front by uh, politicizing rule of law in a variety of ways, trying to protect Trump from a variety of different uh, charges and, and various potentially criminal investigations and so on. And in the more absurd ways, right, where people who were loyal to Trump were put into positions simply because they were loyal to Trump. Again, the most colorful example of this, the, the equivalent of Lynn Patton, uh, Eric Trump's wedding planner for federal housing, the equivalent in the uh, political, sorry, the rule of law uh, in the D Justice Department was Trump tried to appoint a man who was a ghost hunter, a self-proclaimed ghost hunter, to be a federal judge uh, who had never tried a case before. When that appointment failed and was not approved by the Senate, he was put into a senior role in the Department of Justice, right? So a ghost hunter was, uh, was a senior official in the DOJ uh, for some time. And then finally, you also have scapegoating minorities, which is something that we all saw Trump do, um, his visceral extreme attack on black athletes kneeling for the national anthem compared to, for example, the way in which he responded to the Charlottesville protests in which white supremacists marched through Charlottesville alongside the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis. And Trump went at pains to say there were very fine people on both sides. And of course, 
in January 6th, the way that Trump responded, which I'm going to come to in a moment, shows a, a radical uh, interpretation of racial politics in ways that are uh, borrowing from the sort of us versus them mentality that often exists in either authoritarian populism or in autocracies more generally. Now, this authoritarian brand of Trump politics has led to a more authoritarian political base. So you have somebody at the top of the Republican Party who is mimicking the behavior of, des of despots to a diminished degree, but still in, in important ways. And then you have him creating a priming effect for his political base by which it's not just that this is the brand of politics that is the new normal, it's that this is the brand of politics that we like. In other words, they weren't just supporting or accepting Trumpism, they were demanding it from their other Republican affected, elected officials. And this is where the question of authoritarian voters comes in. People who are willing to vote for candidates or endorse platforms of people who say, it doesn't matter what the process is as long as we get what we want. Let's throw away the procedures, the protections of democracy, and let's get the output legitimacy that's what we want. And there's a significant, significant chunk of Trump's political base in the Republican Party that is like that. Now, there are certainly Democrats that are like that, right? If, if you ask Democrats, would you mind them bending or breaking the rules in order to get universal health care passed? A significant chunk of Democrats would probably say so, say, say yes, I'd be okay with that. But the numbers based on the evidence we have, because there have been empirical studies of this, suggest that the number of authoritarian voters at the moment are much, much greater in the Republican Party than the Democratic Party, and Trump is part of the reason for that. Now, when we get to more contemporary issues in terms of the last month and a half or so, we have to recognize that there was a concerted effort by the highest circles of the Republican Party to reject the implications of a free and fair democratic election and keep Donald Trump in power despite the results of that election. And that is a truly striking moment, right? I mean, you can't imagine this happening in, happening in other democracies. And a month ago, a little over a month ago in, uh, on January 6th, more than 100 elected Republicans in Congress voted to overturn the results of a democratic election and to reject the certification of those results. Now, given that there are 535 members of Congress and more than half of them now are Democrats, 100 plus Republicans voting for that is enormous. It's, it's, it's close to half of the Republican caucus in, in both chambers voting in favor of rejecting a Democratic election results. And that is a very big deal. And so when you think about this process between November 3rd and January 6th, this wasn't unpredictable. This wasn't unpredicted. It was something that was very obvious where this was headed because we've seen this film before. We know how this ends in authoritarian style politics. And I wrote a column in May of 2020, you know, quite, quite a while before the January 6th insurrection in which I made three specific predictions about uh, what would happen in the election. And I said, if Donald Trump loses, he's going to reject the election results. He's going to falsely claim they were rigged to save face. And he's going to incite violence because a significant chunk of his base believes him, they're heavily armed, and they could be very dangerous. And of course, that happened. It was not something where I was particularly prescient. It was just that this is something that happens when you have a figure at the top of the party who invokes the language of violence, supports violence repeatedly in their political rhetoric, and also demonizes their opponents as enemies and says, you know, the election was stolen from you. This wasn't a legitimate election. It was a very dangerous political gambit he did, and the outcome was January 6th. Now, when you think about the, the totality of this new dynamic in the Republican Party and the events that happened after a significant chunk of the party voted to overturn the results of a Democratic election, which is, you know, it's as authoritarian as Democratic politics get, you have to think about how do people emerge as stars in the party, right? When we think as political scientists, we often think through the lens of what causes people to gain power or stay in power. It's a very easy, simple way of starting to think about why politicians do things. Now, when it comes to Republican Party politics, obviously getting reelected is important, but also becoming a national social media star or a national media star on Fox News is something that comes with tremendous advantages in American politics. You get huge fundraising potential. You end up as a breakout household name. You might end up getting a plum national post should the Republican Party have a presidential victor in the, in the future, or you may be able to run for national office, right? If you're a House member, you might be able to run for Senate or governor, et cetera. So there's a lot of allure to breaking out as a national star in the party. 
before the current era, to do that, you sort of had to put in your time, right? There were a lot of people who would become national stars because they rose through the ranks. What's been disrupted about the current era is through social media and non-traditional media, people can break out very quickly with a viral tweet or viral video. And this is an example where Lauren Boebert, who's a representative recently elected from Colorado, has shown the sort of toxic dynamics of this radicalization of the Republican Party perfectly. She was an, effectively a nobody who no one had heard of running for house, a house seat in Colorado. Then she gets increasingly extreme with her behavior, records a video in which she boasts that she's going to bring her gun to Congress. Even if they try to stop her, she's gonna bring her gun to Congress. Even if the house passes a rule that says we will find people if they don't go through the metal detector, she's going to bring her gun to Congress, right? And of course, this is what she does. She goes through the metal detector, it beeps and she just keeps walking and her staffers are filming her and they post it to social media and the Republican base goes wild for this. Stick it to the Democrats and their rules and their anti-gun beliefs, right? That's what they, they, they would say. Lauren Boebert ends up on Fox News. She ends up on a variety of different places where she's all of a sudden got this massive fundraising platform. And the incentives to become a star in the modern Republican party go through that style of politics. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a household name after saying that Jewish space lasers caused wildfires or denying that 9-11 happened or supporting QAnon, which is part of the group of conspiracy nuts that stormed the Capitol on January 6th, right? What has happened to the people who are more sober and sane and centrist? Well, Mitt Romney nearly got killed by his own party's political base on January 6th. We saw videos yesterday of how close he came where there was a new video released during the impeachment trial in which Mitt Romney was walking towards the violent mob and one Capitol police officer likely saved his life because he redirected them and you see him on the video running away with the Capitol police officer from the people who are trying to effectively take hostage or beat to death members of Congress. And they, they avoided doing that by a matter of moments. And we saw yesterday in the impeachment trial video of people saying, here, Nancy, where are you, Nancy? Come out, Nancy, talking about Nancy Pelosi because they want to attack her. And we also saw video yesterday of those same people trying to break down a door where Nancy Pelosi's staff was barricaded inside of the US Capitol building. So you think about these dynamics, the people who are getting rewarded in the modern Republican Party are those who are saying Donald Trump did actually won the election. They're lying about that. It's not true, but they're saying it. They're peddling conspiracy theories and false claims that have been adjudicated in the courts. And by saying that, they've become more popular, not less popular. The people who are saying the truth, who are saying Donald Trump lost and that his conduct was unacceptable, which is fair enough, a moral judgment, but still is one of those things where Mitt Romney is, is, is behaving, in my view, much more responsibly and in the world of reality. He nearly gets killed, not by the opposing side, but by his own, right? The, the modern Republican Party is a, is a place where it's dangerous, physically dangerous, to be somebody who stands up to Donald Trump or who even just endorses the results of a democratic election. I mean, that's a remarkable, remarkable truth of modern Republican politics. Now, I just want to say a few more things before I conclude and we open it up to questions. The impeachment trial is a canary in the coal mine for the broken nature of American democracy, not just because of the things that I talked about previously about the dynamics for the Republican Party, but by the fact that some of the people who are now voting on whether Donald Trump stoked insurrection themselves stoked insurrection themselves spoke at these rallies, encouraged people to fight for Donald Trump at the Capitol and use the rhetoric of violence are now jurors in a trial that's trying to adjudicate whether that was unacceptable. And on top of that, they are going to vote to acquit him almost certainly. I mean, we, we could be shocked. You never say never in American politics. Anything, if anything that has taught you humility as a political scientist of the last five years, it's that you know things happen that you don't necessarily anticipate. But Right now, the most likely outcome of this trial is that people who were nearly killed, literally nearly killed by a violent mob incited by Donald Trump are going to use their formal political power to defend the person who incited the violent mob that nearly killed them. And in that moment, you're going to see how hyperpolarization, where people are much more worried about the backlash from their political base is driving the, 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 the party politics in the United States much more than any sense of what's good for the country or even what's good for the party. 
I think that if you spoke candidly off the record with a lot of these Republican senators, I think 100% of them would agree with the statement that it would be better for the Republican Party if Donald Trump was not was not part of it anymore. In other words, if, if he simply decided to remove himself from Republican politics, this would be something that would be good for Republican Party politics. They would privately, I think, agree to that, if not 100%, the overwhelming majority of them. The overwhelming majority of them would almost certainly also privately agree to the statement that Donald Trump incited the insurrection on January 6th, and that without him, there would have been no insurrection on January 6th, which is not a hard leap to make because they're using his slogans, flying his flags, and he spoke before they went to the Capitol and said, go to the Capitol and fight like hell, right? So this is not a hard leap. And then after, of course, the, the, the Capitol insurrection, Trump tweeted that they were great patriots. He told them to remember this day forever. Uh, and he said, I love you in a video uh, to them uh, speaking about them. These are people who violently killed a police officer, uh, injured about 100 police officers, and then were moving towards taking control of the House and Senate with zip ties and stun guns and batons, right? I love you, you're great patriots, um, and remember this day forever. So when you think about those political dynamics that are playing out in the impeachment trial, they are a microcosm of Republican Party authoritarian radicalization, that you reject the precepts of democracy, you go to, to bat for a person who has behaved like an authoritarian figure for the last four years, and you do so solely for the purpose of either getting reelected or in order to enhance your political stardom in, in a party in which moderate, sober problem solving is actively punished. Not that it's not rewarded, it's actively punished. People like Liz Cheney, who is, you know, by the way, quite a far right Republican relative to the national political views. She's quite far to the right. She is someone who is now being called to be purged from the party by the political base because she voted to impeach Donald Trump, right? So there's an active punishment of people who break with Donald Trump or refuse to toe the line of authoritarian style politics, which is something that's going to have ramifications for many, many years to come in, in American democracy. Now, to conclude, I will say as a, as a note of optimism, don't count democracy out in America. The system has experienced significant back, backsliding in the past is in, in, in a way that we probably wouldn't call backsliding because it was much older. But you know, we had a civil war. We had, we've had significant political challenges, mass unrest. And American democracy does have mechanisms built into it that allow reform to happen. Whether those reforms will happen or not in a political environment that is hyper-polarized, that rewards extremism, and that has a dose of authoritarianism within one of the main parties that is, you know, I think, unprecedented, at least in modern American history and possibly in all of Amer American history, is something that I don't know the answer to. And the, the question, so that's the sort of dose of optimism. Unfortunately, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on a dose of a bit more bleakness, uh, simply because I, it's how I feel at the moment about, about this, these prospects. The question that I have a hard time answering positively or optimistically is what will cause these dynamics I just outlined to be reversed? What will cause these structural problems to be fixed? And I don't see an immediate answer to that, that question. There is not an immediate answer to how you can stop politicians from behaving in ways that reward them, particularly because the political base wants Trumpism. They do not want something else. They do not want the Republican Party of Mitt Romney. That is quite clear from all the opinion polls. He is the party of the past. Trump has won the political civil war in the Republican Party. And how do you get politicians to behave in ways that fundamentally go against their self-interest? I don't know the answer to that question, but it would take some political bravery from, from the part of the Republican Party. Where do we come back from the brink and when could that happen? And most importantly, and this is how I'll end things on this bleak note, when will a coalition of reality form? Democracy has enough challenges as we've seen throughout the world, but at least in most democracies, whether it's in the UK or in Japan or other places that we look at as, as uh, examples of democracy, at least politicians inhabit the same world. They know that there are not these extreme conspiracy theories or shadowy forces governing politics, and they don't enter the political debate to nearly the degree they do in the United States. And so I think one of the fundamental points that, that you know, ex ex relates to everything else I've said is that until that coalition of reality, the coalition of insisting on facts is bipartisan without fail, we will live in a world in which American democracy could falter because you have to compromise to solve problems for democracy to work. You cannot compromise or solve problems if you don't agree 
that the problems even exist in the first place. And so with that, I will uh, conclude my remarks and say, the summary is American democracy is in quite a lot of trouble, but let's hope we can turn it around at some point. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. That was a, a lucid and rapid fire um, summary of, of the way things have been going in the United States. And, and thanks very much for that contribution. Um, we're receiving um, um, questions from the, the chat function on YouTube and I'll just read you. Um, I won't give you a group of questions. I'll do it one by one. But the first question is, is what role can, can President Biden play to mitigate the current polarization? It's a great question. So one of the big debates that's happening in, in American democracy right now is what, is what is Biden's role and what does he mean when he says he's pursuing a unity agenda? And I think the mistake that people make when they read this is they think they, that a unity agenda means that he will try to cater to the wishes of Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, or the Republican leaders in Congress. That's not what Biden's talking about when he's talking about a unity agenda. He's talking about an agenda that is broadly supported by the American public, even if Republicans vote against it. And so don't confuse bipartisanship for unity. What I mean by that in specific terms is there are some issues despite hyperpolarization that are widely supported by significant majorities of Americans. One example is COVID relief. So Biden has put together a $1.9 trillion package and we don't know whether it's going to be passed for sure. It looks like it will probably be passed with zero Republican support or very, very low Republican support. But if you poll people about this, 80 to 90% back an ambitious COVID relief package. And that is, I think, one thing that's really important is by, by not sort of diving into those divisive topics, he can build up some political goodwill that will reduce polarization. I think another thing that's important is something like infrastructure, which could also benefit the economic recovery and wide majorities of Republicans and Democrats, and by the way, some elected Republicans view this as an important priority for the United States. So I think what he's going to do early on in his administration is a mix. It's going to be executive orders, as he's done already, on things that are of significance to Democratic voters and trying to show that he's governing as a progressive, but he's also gonna to try to get significant policy achievements that may not have Republican support in Congress, but do have Republican voter support in the broader public. And that is something that he can do that will be very effective. Reducing polarization is going to be a hard problem to solve. I mean, he's not, you know, some people say, if you wanna heal the country, don't impeach Donald Trump. I, I reject that view because I think that one of the things that's quite important about the impeachment proceedings is accountability for this type of behavior to ensure that it doesn't get repeated, right? That we don't have another insurrection next time that we end up in this, in this position. And if that's the case, if, if we end up in a, in, a, in a world in which that accountability exists, I think the short-term cost of upsetting some diehard Trump voters is probably going to actually lead to reduced polarization over time than if there was just impunity for what happened on January 6th. So I don't have a, a comprehensive answer, but I think that, that point about unity versus bipartisanship is an important divide to, to pay attention to. Another question which was um, posed was, what are the global consequences do you think of the storming of the US Capitol? I mean, how is this going to matter globally? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. So, you know, Ronald Reagan in the, in the uh, late 1980s when he was leaving office gave a speech where he talked about the U.S. as a shining city on a hill, right? A beacon for uh, the forgotten people of the world who wanted to aspire to democracy. I don't think that at the moment that beacon is shining very brightly. And I, I, I don't think that there is a significant amount of aspirational democracy that's being tied or tethered to American style democracy right now. The insurrection on January 6th is, is part of that, right? That there is, a, there is an issue by which that level, of, um, that level of violence, that level of dysfunction and chaos created an image for the world that is going to damage the American brand. Right? I think there's no debate about that. The question is, is this permanent or is it temporary? Now on the side of it being temporary, I think there's two important points. One is that the world wants America to be functional as a democracy. People are really excited in Europe, especially in political circles, about the Biden presidency because they feel that they can work with the Biden presidency. They feel that there's a sort of coalition of a belief in democracy amongst these countries that is based on problem solving. 
And so that aspect does lend itself to saying, okay, the insurrection was a disaster, but maybe we've turned the page and maybe we can move on from this. The second data point in, in favor of the idea that America can recover from this uh, global image problem is that when the Iraq war happened, George W. Bush's presidency was viewed terribly by the rest of the world by about 2007. The, 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 if you look at Pew Research data on the percentage of people in different countries who have confidence in America's leadership to do the right thing in global affairs, dismal numbers in 2007. By the end of 2008, after Barack Obama is elected, those numbers are almost vertical on the graph. They've shot up to 80 plus percent, which suggests that there is a willingness to sort of say, our opinions about American democracy and the idea of this beacon are highly contingent on who's in the White House. And perhaps Biden can restore some of that. And I think it's very high on his agenda, by the way. He was, you know, he was the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate for a very long time. And he believes that international cooperation and alliances are very important. But the, the global damage that has been done to America's quote unquote brand of democracy is deep. And I do not think that the repair job will be months. I think it will be years, possibly decades. Uh, and it will be hinging to a certain extent on the problems I identified in, in my remarks, because every time that one of those things comes out, right, the money in politics, the story comes out about that, or there's severe gerrymandering, which is going to happen again in 2021, or, you know, an aspect about the Senate being up unrepresentative, or the electoral college problem, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't provide a good advertisement for American democracy. So I expect that the, the impact of the Trump presidency will erode faith in American style democracy. I hope it won't be permanent. So there's a question from Paige Underholm, who is a master's student in the LSE. If a Republican coalition of reality will be slow to form as it goes against their base, it seems like the solution must come from outside. More a comment than a, than a question. Yeah, I so I think, I think that's, that's, that's an interesting point. The, one of the things that I didn't mention in the talk that's important, and I think with this idea of coming from the outside is, is, is relevant, is with the media. Um, and I think one of the things that is debated by political scientists is to what degree public opinion exists in some sort of fixed form. And people have certain views on politics that are just fundamental to them and to what extent they're shaped by elites or media. And I think the, the consensus in political science seems to show that there is a significant amount of shaping that's happening, that pol politicians can sway public opinion in significant ways, as can media framing of, of coverage. And this is where I think, you know, it's, it's again, it's asymmetrical when you look at American media. Yes, MSNBC and CNN have political biases. Yes, their commentators tend to be more to the left uh, and, and certainly are Trump critics, right? There, there's no question about that. But the dynamics on Fox News and to a greater extent, what's called One American News OAN or Newsmax, which are these sort of newcomers in the, in the Trump world where they're, they're they, they don't really exist in, in, in reality, right? I mean, Newsmax and OAN are one step removed at most, but not far from RT. Um, they, they are quite extreme networks that for the months between November 3rd and January 6th, unequivocally peddled uh, falsehoods. They're getting sued, by the way, by a variety of companies because they lied about them. Um, you know, the, the, the depths of absurdity in these claims is hard to overstate. The Dominion Voting Systems, for example, was accused by some Trump surrogates on various media outlets of being directed by basically Hugo Chavez, who is dead, um, and having some implications related to Venezuela. It has nothing to do with what actually happened at all. It's, it's total nonsense. But it was aired as, as though it was normal and, and, and real on those media outlets. So I think that, that the point that you're raising, Paige, is important in terms of how do you get it from the outside? Well, you have, to, you have to get through to people who are consuming information that is fundamentally untrue, right? The, the, the dilemma is not just Fox News, it's also social media, right? Social media is a, is a world in which people self-select into partisan echo chambers. We, we as humans don't like consuming content that disagrees with us. So that personal curation of the echo chamber on social media combined with increasingly extreme figures on right-wing media, which is not about partisanship, but it's about reality, uh, is, is one where to fix the, the problem, I think you do need to create better incentives. And one possibility is it may be that the, the Fox News and OANs and Newsmaxes of the world end up paying significant damages for the things where they fundamentally lied about companies. 
and individuals. And if those lawsuits proceed, they raise some interesting First Amendment free speech questions, but they, if they were to proceed and, and cause significant damages, that could be the first step in pushing Republican Party news media uh, towards, the, towards the coalition of reality, which, which would affect uh, party politics at the elite level. Um, Paige um, posed another question. To what extent will organizations like Fair Fight, which work towards ensuring free and fair elections, be critical to finally addressing the structural problems you were talking about? It's a great question. So let's let's start with one thing that's important to, to remember with U.S. elections. U.S. elections have a lot of problems, right? So gerrymandering, the influence of money in politics, things like that, voter suppression as well, in which, you know, especially in minority heavy communities, there are significantly fewer precincts if they're governed by Republican states. That's one of the, the strategies that's used or suppression via um, requirement of photo ID in a place where, you know, like my, my, my photo ID for America is either my passport or my driver's license, two things that skew disproportionately towards affluent people, or at least not poor people, right? Because if you don't have a car and you've never traveled internationally, you're not gonna have a photo ID in the US. So these elements of American democracy with elections are very problematic. What's the interesting dynamic here though, is that those things which are real concerns are only perceived as real concerns by democratic leaning voters. Republican leaning voters believe widespread voter fraud exists, which is not true, right? One of the studies that looked at American democracy studied the number of fraudulent ballots cast in, in American elections, federal elections between 2000 and 2014. And there were over that 15 year period, a number of verified cases of voter fraud of 31 cases out of more than 1 billion with a B ballots cast infinitesimal problem. And the reason is obvious. It's because you go to jail if you commit voter fraud. It's a felony. And, and, and people have been jailed for up to five years for committing voter fraud. So it's incredibly irrational to do as an individual voter. The logic of voter fraud, by the way, does not make sense. Trump has claimed, as he did in 2016, that millions of California voters who were illegal immigrants voted in a way that they shouldn't. In other words, they shouldn't have been allowed to vote and they cast ballots. Think about the logic of that, right? People who are illegally in the country who are trying to avoid detection are going to go to a polling location where they have to have their identity verified in order to cast a ballot in a state that is 100% going to vote for the Democrat, right? I mean, it's the most irrational claim that would ever exist. And yet that's widespread. Uh, it's a wide, widely believed view among Republican voters is that this voter fraud does exist. So to solve the problem, you first have to identify what it is, and that's something that's already a, an issue. Now, if you can have reforms to American democracy such that they make the elections more fair, yes, I think there would be significant improvements to the quality of democracy overall. So you can lower barriers to voting, right? There's many, many ways in which you can figure out uh, whether someone actually lives where they live without photo identification. There are many, many ways, or, or alternatively, you can, ident you can issue free, free voter identification cards to people with limited barriers to, to access so that if you don't have a driver's license or a passport, you can vote. You can mandate minimum and maximum waiting times in precincts, right? And find states or jurisdictions that don't provide uh, equitable wait times. Because right now in African-American majority neighborhoods, you've, you will wait on average six times longer than on the average white neighborhood in the United States. And that's obviously undemocratic and unfair. You could create penalties for those inequities. All of these things are not rocket science. And the reason they're not rocket science is because some of these problems I'm identifying are uniquely American, right? For gerrymandering, you can solve that problem. You can create citizen-led commissions, or you can have independent bodies that are not comprised of politicians drawing the district lines. And by doing so, you could create a system that's much more fair. And, and as you do all these reforms, yes, it will improve the quality of American democracy. But those reforms still exist with a bigger problem, as I highlighted, which is, what do you do? This is the fundamental point I come back to over and over who, for people who criticize my work and say, I'm exaggerating the problems. I say, what do you do when close to half of the country has agreed with authoritarian conduct, has agreed with someone who's peddled conspiracy theories for four years, has agreed with someone who's incited violence, 
that's not a structural problem. It's a problem with, the, with, with political attitudes in the United States. And conspiratorial thinking, by the way, is something that's, that's not going to get solved by structural reforms, gerrymandering or not. People who are in QAnon and believe these insane uh, you know, beliefs about what the Democratic Party is up to, they're not coming back to, to, to reality because of gerrymandering reform or reduced voter suppression. So the problem cuts deep not just on structural problems, though the, structure, the structural reforms would go a long way in solving some of the issues that I talked about. Okay, Brian, um, another question from Isabel McRae. Can you talk more about the role of socioeconomic inequalities as relating to political participation? Great question. So I already talked a little bit about voter suppression in terms of minority communities and because of racial inequities in the United States that does relate to socioeconomic status. But I'll talk about this in a broader sense, which is, I think there is a, a important shift from what the problem was in American democracy's participation level over time. So in the past, there was low turnout as well. Uh, American democracy has never had high levels of, of voter participation. But still, even in the 2020 elections, in which it increased substantially year on year, uh, I think it was around 64%. I can't remember the exact number, but it was, it was between 60 and 65% which is dismal from a European perspective. And it's one of the most important elections. I think, it's pro I think that will have been the most important election in my lifetime, probably. I hope, <laughs> I hope it's the most consequential election in my lifetime. And yet you still had, you know, 35% of eligible voters didn't, didn't show up. And one of the points I make about this in, um, uh, in the 2016 contest was if you take the, the, you know, out of every 10 voters in the US, adults in the United States, in the 2016 election, three out of 10 roughly adults voted for Donald Trump. In the 2016 election, about three out of 10 adults voted for Hillary Clinton and about four out of 10 adults did not vote, right? So a, plur a plurality of the votes was actually to not vote. So when you think about it in those terms, it's quite a stark problem, right? That you didn't have, you didn't have any sort of level of high participation and even in highly consequential elections. Now, when it comes to socioeconomics, that obviously matches on significantly, right? The, that poorer voters are less likely to turn out. Now, what Trump did, and this is important, is that poorer, rural, uneducated white voters voted in, of new voters, voted in greater numbers for Donald Trump than has been the case in quite a lot of elections. So he did activate people who were uninterested in politics before. One of the things, and this relates to the quality of democracy more generally, is I think in the pre-social media period and the pre-disinformation period, and of course, yes, there were lies percolating through politics forever. This is not new. But I think the, the sort of dynamics of that have gotten on steroids as a result of social media and some of the, the, the dynamics I talked about in right-wing media, et cetera. Because of those dynamics of disinformation and false claims on social media, previously uninformed voters are being replaced by misinformed voters, which I think is a very important change. Because uninformed voters either didn't care that much or they just voted sort of for the party that their parents did, right? They sort of, oh, I grew up as a Republican, I'll just tick the box for the Republican or the Democrat, whatever it is. Misinformed voters are potentially very engaged in politics and they're basing their political engagement on lies. And I think this is where like the things like QAnon, which were part of the insurrection on January 6th are so important because a lot of those people probably didn't vote previously. And now politics is not just a hobby, it's, it's their identity. They, they, they identify as a Trump voter. And this, is, this relates to, to one of the points that I think cuts in with the socioeconomic aspects of this is that poor, the poor voters who didn't used to see themselves in American politics and now see themselves in Donald Trump view their political identity through an individual and not through a, a programmatic party platform. In other words, when you ask Democrats, there's a poll that came out two days ago, you ask Democrats, are you a Biden supporter or are you a Democrat? Democrats overwhelmingly say they're a Democrat. If you ask Republicans, are you a Republican or a Trump supporter? They overwhelmingly say I'm a Trump supporter. And that's a very big problem for American democracy that has distributional aspects related to socioeconomic status where poorer Americans in Trump's base are often becoming diehard political, and they're, they're, they're part of a diehard process of political engagement based on false claims. And, and I think that is, is very, very uh, problematic. Now, of course, this is not true of all, everyone. I mean, you know, QAnon people are not the same as Trump supporters. There, there's a difference there. But it does worry me that some people who are not part of the political system normally are getting lied to and then are, are basing their 
political engagement on those lies uh, in ways that are very problematic. In terms of the socioeconomic status, the one last thing I'll say that is something the, Repu the Democratic Party, because I haven't talked about the Democratic Party's problems much. The Democratic Party does have a problem in the sense that it has become the party of cities and suburbs. The reason why Democrats have won the presidency and the reason why they've won uh, control of the House and the Senate is because they, they consolidated their gains in urban areas and then they flipped some voters who used to be Republicans in the suburbs and made them Democrats. They are getting absolutely wiped out in rural areas. I mean, if you look at a map by county of the 2020 election, it is one giant red with a bit of pinpricks of blue. Um, and, and the Republican Party has captured people who are poorer than average in rural areas who don't see a future in what they see as the democratic America. And that problem is one that I think democratic party politics needs to grapple with. I, I think it is potentially a big issue for the party if it's only cities and suburban voters who will ever vote for democratic candidates. Okay, there are some more questions, um, Brian, um, from an unknown um, viewer. Do you think that media regulation is a viable option to tackle the spread of misinformation? And if so, do you think it's desirable or likely in the US? This is a very difficult question and for a few reasons. One is that First, First Amendment protections in the United States are quite robust. In other words, there's, there's quite a lot you can get away with saying in America um, in ways that might be criminalized in the United States. There's very narrow restrictions on speech in America. And that creates issues for any sort of media regulation because of the ample latitude given to media outlets. There is a legitimate debate on those lawsuits that I talked about in which uh, you know, people who were anchors on Fox News or on OAN or Newsmax were saying absurdly false things that were defaming companies. But they will claim in their defense that it was of news interest and it was part of their free speech protections because they were covering what the president was saying, right? So their, their argument will be, yes, this was false, but it's what the president was saying and therefore it's newsworthy. So we need to be able to talk about it. So that gives you an idea of, you know, the fact that that's not a slam dunk case where it might be in, in, in the United Kingdom, it might be considered defamation. It won't necessarily be considered defamation in the United States, we'll see. The second reason why it's a tricky issue is because the victimhood narrative of Republican party politics related to the media of the last two decades is one that talks about censorship and media bias. And so the problem of regulation is it can backfire. If you were to say, you know, imagine shutting down Fox News or Newsmax or OAN, it could actually accelerate the radicalization of some of the voters. Now you'd have to weigh that up even if you could do that against the free speech concerns, against all these other claims, et cetera. So I'm speaking in hypothetical terms, but there could be, there could be some negative effects of it as well. There's a debate around this, of course, with banning Trump from Twitter, because he was the number one source of election-related disinformation and misinformation in the United States. We, we, we know this for a fact. Uh, there have been studies of this. And when you look at the networks of, of Twitter users and then the claims that are being amplified across other social media networks, whether it be TikTok, Instagram, or Facebook, you can trace them back to Donald Trump and the surrogates that he amplifies, you can look at a map of this network. And what you see is at the center of the network is Donald Trump. And then you see the, the Trump, pro-Trump figures. And then you see the normal accounts of average people repeating these false claims. Now, Trump's ban from Twitter did create backlash on the right, right? I mean, people were very angry. There was worries about security of Twitter employees shortly after and whether they, you know, saying, try to be careful when coming to work, very ugly stuff about physical safety. And, and you know, hopefully there's not further worries or warnings about that, but the backlash did exist. On the other hand, as someone who uses Twitter, Twitter is a radically different place without Donald Trump. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the, the discourse on there is not constantly about this, you know, fire hose of false claims and instead, you know, it still exists uh, on the right, but it's gone to different places. And this is one of the things that I think will be interesting to see is what happens if you try to regulate mainstream media? Is it a game of whack-a-mole? Is it a game where the second that you try to suppress it somewhere, it pops up somewhere else? We saw that with Parler, which is a social media outlet that was um, developed for people with quite extreme views. And, and the Parler app was central to the January 6th insurrection. And in a sort of, I mean, tragicomic way, the, the users of Parler didn't realize that there were effectively no data protections for them whatsoever 
And so it was possible to geolocate um, their photos and live streams of storming the Capitol such that it's being used in evidence in criminal trials because Twitter and Facebook and, and normal social media companies, they strip what's called the metadata out of images or videos that you produce. Parler didn't do that. And so they could pinpoint to extreme accuracy who was actually physically in the Capitol and who was outside of it based on that. So anyway, it's a, it's a side point, but this relates to this question of, can you ever regulate information in a free society? You know, I, that's a much bigger debate. I don't know the answer to it. I can't, I can't promise to have any sort of uh, fresh insights on that. But I think that this is going to be a huge problem for the future of American democracy, because the lesson, in my opinion, of the last 10 plus years, especially in the social media golden age, which has been, you know, whether it's golden or not is open to interpretation, but the last sort of 10 years since 2010, when it's become ubiquitous in, in our politics, is that if you break the source of information, if you break the information flow, you break democracy. So I think that's one of the things that's, that's very important to, to keep in mind is that until the information that people receive is of greater quality, the voting, the political decision-making, the political calculations made by elected officials, that will remain broken as well. Because fundamentally, democracy is based on the decisions that we come to uh, derive from a set of information or a set of facts that we know to be true. And if we can't accept that bedrock principle of saying, these are the facts we know to be true, we can never move towards compromise. I don't have an answer, unfortunately, to the question of how you solve that problem. Because if I did, I mean, I, I would love to fix it. But it's going to be the problem that I think you know, bedevils democratic democracy scholars for some time to come, and also particularly in America. Um, there was one last question, which really covers what you've already talked about, and um, it was about Twitter and free speech or something. But let's just say in, in, in some that the, the question was, does social media help or hinder a healthy democracy? Yeah, it's that's that's a great question. So one of the things that I wrote about in my book about authoritarianism was, you know, there was this, there was this narrative that formed around social media uh, when it first came out, where there was this sort of optimism that we'd soon be seeing Twitter revolutions left and right, that, you know, Twitter would topple authoritarian governments because it would provide a level of accountability, transparency, and coordination for social movements to stand up to authoritarian regimes that was previously impossible in these places. What we've seen instead is that social media is a tool and like any other tool, authoritarian governments are pretty good at co-opting it for their own purposes. And I think that that's something where when you think about this in the broader world beyond America, uh, that's one of the lessons is that, yes, there is coordination uh, on social media of protest movements, right? In, in Myanmar, the government has tried to shut down social media as a way to block these protest movements from coordinating, and yet they are still succeeding in doing so to, cer to a certain degree. Now, in America, you know, I think social media has been a significant hindrance to democracy on balance, right? And it's not because the American government has done the same thing that authoritarian governments have done, which is to say using it to track people in ways that are uh, hyper damaging to democracy or co-opting it for their own purposes. It's more because of this broken information system that I'm talking about. And, and I think that the debate around media regulation from the last question as well, that I, I didn't touch on enough is that yes, social media companies do need to do more in terms of ensuring that, you know, false content that's spreading significantly is taken down quickly. Um, you know, I, there's, there's questions about this and what the role of of social media companies are in free speech. You know, is it for Facebook to determine what's true and false? That creates some uncomfortable free speech questions. But I do think that they have a much greater responsibility of taking down content, especially things that incite violence, things that are a menace to public health, right? They're, they've taken action recently today on, on Robert uh, Kennedy Jr.'s uh, Instagram account in terms of taking it down because it's spreading anti-vaccine conspiracy theories, which are fundamentally false. So there is a greater role for social media companies in, in, in policing false content that has the ability to damage democracy significantly. What I think is a much harder question to answer is on balance, would we be better off if Facebook had never been invented and Twitter had never been invented? 
I, 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 I tend to think yes. Um, I tend to think that on balance, it's been bad for democracy. But it's difficult to say because, of course, there are other aspects of social media that have been brilliant for democracy in terms of organizing protests, in terms of organizing uh, policy movements, in organizing discourse among people who believe that they you know, ha could have their voices heard more by, by, by speaking on social media. And it has democratized to a large degree um, public opinion and speech around policy issues where ordinary people can weigh in and, and debate with politicians or debate with pundits in ways that were fundamentally unthinkable uh, previously. That comes with a downside as someone who gets death threats uh, often when I write about President Trump or a peer talking about President Trump on CNN. Um, so it comes with the downside that there's that accessibility and accountability, but, but there are some upsides. On balance, I am in the camp of people who think that it's made democracy worse. Um, but you know, I think there's a significant proportion of people who, who disagree with me. So I'll leave it to you to decide. Okay, Brian, there is just one, one more question, which is from Benjamin Grasta, who is a master's student here at the LSA. Facebook's business model still pushes disinformation six times faster than true information and profits off polarization. Is it possible to change Facebook's and others' business models under Biden? Yeah, so this is where I think, I do think that there will be a significant push to try to regulate social media companies. And one of the areas of this uh, where I think there needs to be much greater scrutiny is how social media companies radicalize users. Facebook did an internal assessment of who ended up in QAnon groups, QAnon being this extreme right-wing dangerous conspiracy theory linked to real world violence, both in January 6th and kidnappings and shootings and, and, and a variety of other things. When they did an internal audit of how these people ended up clicking on join QAnon group X, what they found is that the majority of them ended up in those groups because of Facebook's algorithm. In other words, Facebook suggested to them, have you thought about joining this group? Now that level of, of uh, of, of scrutiny, I think, is, is really important for governments to get involved in because social media companies are existing in the Wild West, right? They're existing in a framework that is highly unregulated, and we are leaving up a huge amount of decisions to people like Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey about fundamental questions of democracy. Now, my view is not that we should shut down Facebook or shut down Twitter or here's how we should police them. My view is that the people who make those decisions should be citizens and not Mark, Mark Zuckerberg, his employees, or Jack Dorsey and his employees. So I think there needs to be a democratic process that approaches these problems and that involves you know, proposals debated in Congress and parliaments, et cetera, that significantly ramps up the regulation that provides rules that are actually ultimately good for Facebook and Twitter because part of the problem with existing in the Wild West is they're exposing themselves to liabilities, right? Facebook and Twitter are, are having discussions right now about to what extent do we hold culpability for January 6th? To what extent do we hold culpability or liability for some of the events or violence that has been stoked on our platforms? And so what they would like, I think, is sort of a clear guide, a clear set of guidelines that say, here are the rules of this new world of social media. And here's what you have to do. And if you do it, it's fine. And if you don't, you're gonna get fined, right? So I think this is, this is the issue that's a huge, huge problem for American democracy and democracy around the world is that the social media companies do have too much power. And they don't have too much power because they're big or because a lot of people use them. They have too much power because they're existing in a regulatory wilderness. So my view is that, you know, I'm not going to give a prescriptive answer to this, but I do think that there needs to be much more scrutiny of things like algorithms and how they radicalize people, and also the algorithms that detect damaging speech that is fundamentally illegal or dangerous or could lead to, to violence. And that level of audit, I think, from the government is something that, that could be positive for American democracy and for Americans uh, and people around the world, indeed. Okay, I do promise that this is the last question, but it's on a slightly different topic from Matthew Brown. In the wake of January 6th, what role do you think militias like the Oath Keepers have played and will play in American politics? So this is, this is one of the things that I think is really dangerous about the current moment in American politics is that a significant number of people, uh, and I mean raw numbers, right? I, I don't necessarily mean in, a lot, in, in terms of proportion, but a significant number of people, quite literally millions of people, 
sympathize with what happened on January 6th or believe it was justified in some way. Uh, now, if you look at different polls, there's different rates of this, but it's within the Republican Party, we're talking probably between 20 and 40 percent of Republican Party voters believe that the Capitol insurrection was either good or was justified in some way or that it, it was deserved, right, this idea. That is a big problem. And there are groups like the Oath Keepers, like QAnon, like some of the other militias, like the Three Percenters, et cetera, that are heavily armed, are extremely dangerous, and are willing to act on, on their, um, their extreme beliefs. Are they going to go away? Well, you know, the thing that's scary about January 6th to me is the reason why the timing of that insurrection happened was because it was the first moment or the focal point in which Donald Trump was going to be clearly removed from power, right? It was the moment in which the certification of the election would, would ensure that he's not going to be president on January 20th. So if the logic is, okay, the time to fight is when Donald Trump is getting pushed out of power, you would think that that logic would mean that when Donald Trump is actually out of power and when things that they reject as, you know, the actions of the enemies of Donald Trump are starting to take effect, you know, you're, you're passing bills that Joe Biden is signing. It worries me that that would be a moment for them to also object to in ways that are violent. So I think, you know, this is, this is the dynamic that is going to plague American politics for some time. I would be shocked if January 6th was the last moment of significant political violence uh, in, in the next four years. I, I anticipate fully that at some point in Biden's presidency, there will be another moment of significant political violence in, in potentially even worse ways. And, and that's something where, again, there are consequences to political rhetoric and political behavior. Donald Trump's tweets and words mattered. They changed the dynamic of the Republican Party. They incited otherwise peaceful uh, Republican voters to become violent. And they eroded the commitment to American democracy within the Republican Party that will last for some time. Within that group, there's two different camps, right? And this is something that I've, I've talked about in, in a recent column I wrote, which was there's a group of people in the Republican Party that are willing to inhabit the coalition of reality, right? They, they, they sort of hold their nose when they vote for Donald Trump. They're like, this is not really what we want, but we like his judges or we hate Joe Biden or we hate Hillary Clinton. Those people, I think, are far less of a menace to American democracy than people like the Oath Keepers, right? They're not coming back. There's not some, there's not some program where you know, Fox News gets more centrist coverage or less extreme coverage, and all of a sudden the Oath Keepers become Mitt Romney supporters. They're, they're people who are not going to change their political views. And as a result, there has to be a containment strategy for these millions of people who are heavily armed militia extremists. And that is where I think what Biden will do is he's going to reverse decisions taken under the Trump Department of Justice that basically defunded the elements that were looking at white racial, you know, white racist domestic extremists and domestic terrorists, and is going to make them a significant focus of law enforcement and domestic intelligence activity that tries to ensure that those people who will always exist are unable to carry out violent attacks. And so I think that's going to be a sea change in the, in the sort of mandate that Biden gives to organizations like the FBI to tackle uh, right-wing white supremacist extremism in a way that was fundamentally uh, different and, and rejected under uh, President Donald Trump. But that is, that is the, the worry I have is I, I don't think that we're out of the woods. I, I, January 6th was shocking. It was probably not the end point. It was probably the beginning of um, showing that there's a very virulent strain of extremism and violence in American politics that's, that's here to stay, unfortunately. Okay, on that sober note, I think that brings the questions um, to an end. And thanks for all those questions. And thanks to anyone who was watching in. Um, we have um, in the government department as part of the conflict research groups um, events program, other events that are going to come along later in the term. So if you're interested, um, just get in touch with the department or look up the website. So you know, to bring it to an end, um, I want to thank um, Dr. Brian Klass or Professor Brian Klass for answering uh, so many questions and, and showing such um, a comprehensive knowledge of, of what's going on in America at the moment and um, really was really interesting. 
Um, I'd also like to thank um, Diego Sazo and, and Kirsty Conway for help organizing this event. And um, I certainly found it um, enlightening, even if worrying. So um, thanks to those people and, and hope to see you all again at a, an event in the government department in the future. Thanks very much.